dear friends. Thanks for joining me again. We're so happy to have you and share this awesome content again. We have a special guest today. Her name is Junie Boucher, and she's coming from Oregon, Portland, right? Yeah, yeah. Portland, Oregon. Yeah, so I'm so excited to connect. She has lots of of great specialties and she's had a journey and she's sharing, you know, a lot of times adversity leads to discovery and, and growth. So I'm so excited and, and pleased to have her and honored that she's willing to share her story and, and her wealth of information of health and wellness. And uh, Junie, would you like to share like your specialty with my audience so they can get to know you a little better? I would love to do that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So yeah, I am a certified nutritional therapy practitioner. I've also been certified to teach meditation. And I specialize in breast cancer, um, women walking through the breast cancer journey, as well as breast cancer survivorship. And uh, I love hormones. Hormones are actually very much connected to most breast cancer cases. So I also work with you know, women going through hormonal imbalance and, um, you know, sexual dysfunction. I am a member of the Rose City Sexual Health Collective out here in Portland, Oregon. So beyond my regular practice, I also work with a network of really incredible practitioners who um, we kind of take a holistic approach to sexual health. So if people are having, you know, pelvic pain or, um, you know, just other kinds of issues with libido and stuff like that. We can work with them. We can work uh, with couples. But yeah, I, I take the approach of, you know, let's look at your foundational health. Let's look at your stress management. And uh, those two things are often the first step that you really need to take and get solid. And a lot of the other things kind of work themselves out. But uh, like I said, I have this great team of other practitioners behind who can really help pinpoint some of the other issues and tackle things holistically for people. Oh, my goodness. That sounds so um, dynamic. And, you know, just you're not just looking at one little, ooh, let's, let's look at breast cancer. Oh, let's look at sexual function. Let's look at the whole thing. I, I love that approach. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it, it is very effective because a lot of things, as I'm sure your listeners are probably aware of, you know, a lot of things are connected to, you know, your hormones and, and some physiological things. If you don't feel good in your own skin uh, and or if your hormones are out of whack, it's just really hard to to sleep well. And if and, um, you know, just feel good. It might, you might be very anxious or depressed and that can often be tied to just your general health. And there are things that you can do before you go a medication route or something like that. Right. Well, I'm, I'm really curious because I didn't realize um, breast cancer is linked to a hormone imbalance and um, I'm, I'm just not up to the research mm -hmm. in that. Can you, can you share, is it like a cause and effect at this point or is it um, just a correlation mm -hmm. Yeah, so there there are multiple types of breast cancer, but the majority of breast cancer cases are what are considered hormonally driven. So the cancer cells have receptors on them that are fueled by estrogen and sometimes progesterone. So if you have an imbalance of estrogen and progesterone, which is sometimes a condition called estrogen dominance, which is super duper common in women who are, you know, going through perimenopause or menopause, and it's very it's something that's very susceptible to stress, to environmental toxins, and um, even to to your diet and lifestyle. Those things, when they get out of whack, what can happen is it can just fuel these these circulating cancer cells. Which the something I don't think a lot of people realize is that our bodies are pretty much everybody has cancer cells that are circulating throughout their body, whether or not your immune system is able to to get rid of them or not is really a factor in whether or not you will develop cancer. So when you have hormonal disruption, that can that can lead to cancer. And it's I believe the statistic is that over 80% of breast cancer cases are mm -hmm. fueled by hormones. So that's one of the really important reasons for making sure that your hormones are balanced. And the good news is that if you do balance your hormones, uh, it, it makes the rest of your life better. But that is a risk factor. All right. So, I mean, I have to ask, how mm -hmm. how would a person know 
that she has a, mm-hmm. an estrogen dominance. How does she know her hormones are out of whack? What are the major symptoms? Yeah, there's so many different symptoms. And I think they are so common now that people almost consider them normal, which is, which is, uh, you know, bums me out because I don't want people to think they have to live that way. Um, if you are estrogen dominance, you can get the classic symptoms of, you know, brain fog, just the general symptoms of, um, you know, any kind of hormone imbalance. Usually it's fatigue, maybe difficulty with weight gain, um, specifically around that middle area. You might have um, trouble sleeping. You may have anxiety, depression. Uh, what else? God, there's, gosh, there's so many different things. And really a lot of it is, um, a lot of it too is, is stress related. I mean, really just, it's hard in our day and age with the amount of sugar that most of us are consuming on a regular basis mm-hmm. because it's in everything. Um, mm-hmm. the, the people aren't really cooking as much as they were before because they're so busy. They're so stressed out. They're trying to do so many things. They're not figuring out ways to counterbalance their stress, those types of things. Uh, and they can lead to, um, this cascade of hormone imbalance. I mean, Hormone imbalance, there's so many nuances to it, but Mm -hmm. I think most of us know if you feel frazzled all the time, if at night you can't sleep, um, but you're so tired and you can't, you know, that tired and wired, it's all related. That's, you know, that can be a cortisol response that can be, um, but it, it's like a, when one thing's out of balance, usually other things are out of balance too. There are tests Mm -hmm. that, um, specifically the Dutch test is a great, is a great test for that, um, to determine, you know, what your specific hormone imbalance is. But even with tests like the Dutch test, I mean, you're, you're going to, it's, it's hard to really get like a super duper clear picture of what's going on in terms of, what functional tests are out there. The Dutch test, which is something where you are, it's a dried urine test. So you are Mm. urinating on these strips throughout the day. And how, and the reason why that's considered so much better than like a blood test, which your regular doctor probably won't even give you because most women are going to see major hormonal fluctuations throughout even the day. So if you take a snapshot you have no idea what's going on really like in the bigger picture sense. So a Dutch test can really tell you, are you detoxifying your estrogen well, um, which is another thing like, you know, what is, how healthy is your liver? Are you being overloaded by environmental toxins, which Mm -hmm. we're all exposed to regardless of the efforts we're making just by being out in the world? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. So, (laughs) well, I guess if you're feeling bad, you got to start somewhere. And so, yeah, that liver thing, I I love, um, I don't know if you've ever followed uh, the medical medium, Anthony Williams. He has this liver cleanse Mm -hmm. book that is just, oh my goodness, like he'll tell you how to make a smoothie and it's a liver cleanse smoothie. And he's big on the celery juice and, and that kind of thing. But, um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I really want to talk about this more, but I also want to talk about the fluctuate. Like you're talking about the fluctuations mm-hmm. in hormones mm-hmm. and how that can affect your libido. But I want to honor this because we went so deep into the hormones with breast cancer. So I don't want to mm-hmm. I don't want to minimize that. So I guess if you're feeling any of those symptoms, you need to really look at your lifestyle mm-hmm. and look at. From what I heard you say, you look at your stress, your cortisol, your sleep, and your diet. And mm-hmm. sugar, sugar does mm-hmm. trigger hormones. Like, how does what's the sugar factor? I want to get that cleared up too. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the major causes of stress in the body is blood sugar dysregulation. So if you're on this roller coaster of blood sugar, like let's say your ne- your normal routine is you get up, you have two young kids, you have to get them to school. So you're making them breakfast, they have a bagel and some orange juice and uh and you're just eating scraps off their plate and you've got some coffee, you got a latte from Starbucks, but you don't have any protein, you don't have any fat. 
you know, you got that little kick from the from the caffeine and all the adrenaline because you're trying to get everybody out the door. You get the kids to school. Then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I'm so tired. Um, maybe you, you grab a, a pastry or something like that. You start that blood sugar mm-hmm. back up again. And when you don't eat a balanced meal, so that's the – like. I like to describe blood sugar to my clients in the sense of like, if if blood sugar is a balloon, you know, and, and let's say you have a croissant in the morning, right? That's pretty much just carbohydrates. So your blood sugar is going to go up. What your body does is it secretes insulin to bring that blood sugar down, um, to kind of balance things out. And usually what happens is it overshoots. <laughs> so then you kind of go low. That's when you get like kind of hangry or shaky or you feel really tired or you're just like, oh, I just need a little something sweet because that's the body going a little mm-hmm. bit too low in the blood sugar dip. And then it wants to kick you back up again. This is why so many people have what they call like the three o'clock afternoon slump. That's a result of being on a blood sugar roller coaster because maybe you had maybe what you had at lunch stuff. So if that when that balloon goes up, you know, it's not like you need to cut out carbohydrates completely. I mean, not eating things like cake or, you know, just a muffin and a coffee for breakfast, um, something like you want to have protein and fat. I mean, ideally, there are better carbohydrate sources. Fruit, fruit is better for you in terms of it's still a sugar according to your body, but you've got the fiber, you've got the nutrients. And if you combine that with some fat and protein, like maybe some, like some high quality sausage, uh, or like an avocado scramble, something like that, that really just helps slow down the blood sugar escalation. So you want, instead of being on a roller coaster that has really high highs and really low lows, you really want to try to manage it and make it like a baby roller coaster. And that's going to help. Yeah. Or like, yeah, like a a freight train. Think about, you know, feed yourself to do that freight train. You got low and and strong because we got to power through our day. We got lots to do. Yes. And that's going to keep your energy a lot more sustained, your brain clearer. Mm -hmm. You won't get that irritable um, drop that you feel that makes you just like, I just need, I just need food right now. You know, that's that hangry response. So Mm. most people are in a state of chronic blood sugar dysregulation. And that that uh, really contributes to hormone imbalance because if you're, um, you know, after a while when your body is constantly pumping that insulin to bring that blood sugar down, you develop what's called insulin. Um, what it, what it, like your insulin resistance or something? Yeah, insulin resistance. So your insulin sensitivity yeah. is, you know, just mm-hmm. it, you need more and more, and um, it's an easy fix. That's the great thing is that when you when you just start eating balanced meals, like your blood sugar will regulate very quickly. And that's why people who have type two diabetes, that's something you can most definitely reverse quite fast with, with a proper diet or a balanced diet. So, um, yeah, that's, that's one of the easiest ways to help with stress and hormone dysregulation. That's like usually where we start for most people. I know it's so easy to eat bad. I mean, <laughs> right? Like everywhere you can get like a pre-made, like terrible muffin that's just completely sh- like if you start looking at sugar, mm-hmm. like I, I really got serious with it. Like I, I'd say about 10 years ago because I had chronic rosacea mm. and I was like, I am not going to walk around with rosacea. Like there's something wrong. And I started this Tosca Reno. She does oh, um, her, clean. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Love her. Yeah, so she great. was just amazing. I'm like, okay, I'm on her bandwagon. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna just read her books and I'm gonna figure it out. And I, I could not believe like we're only supposed to get like 24 grams of sugar the whole day. Mm-hmm. And if you start looking at labels, oh yeah, and then you add processed white flour to the pure sugar that's like twice as much as you're supposed to have the whole day, yeah. I have compassion for people because not everybody got rosacea and said, I got to do something like I'm just like I'm like a canary. Like I will (laughs) react if there's any if there's anything wrong with fish, I'm throwing up if there's. Oh, really? Wow. (laughs) 
Yeah, like I've thrown, I can't even eat mussels mm-hmm. because I've gotten so sick. <laughs> I missed my husband's 10th um, tenth year class reunion because I was puking in the bathroom. Oh, no. People thought I drank too much, but I was just sick from mussel appetizer. Oh, no. So, I mean, I could go on and on about my sensitivities, but I, I really view it as a gift because yeah. it's made me really, really mindful mm-hmm. because I don't want to feel bad and I don't want to be knocked down. So that mindfulness is, you know, I, if I could, you know, share that with people to eat with the, like you're saying, have your fat, have your protein, Mm -hmm. look at, look at how much sugar you're taking in, how much sugar is in that latte. They'll put the the pumpkin spice flavor and it'll be all corn syrup. You Mm -hmm. look at it. Um, So you really have to, you really have to plan for when you want to indulge. You were saying, you know, if you're going to have a holiday meal, like plan the, the meal before and the mm-hmm. meal after, can you give some insight as to what you'd recommend for when, when you know you're going to have like, you're going to have pie and you know you're going to have mashed potatoes and you know you're going to have some high sugar stuff. So what would you do for breakfast? Mm-hmm. Would you would you do intermittent fasting around that? Or would you be mindful of what you ate right mm-hmm. after you fasted? Like what what's your game plan? You know, I it really depends on the person. Like if you're somebody who has been doing intermittent fasting for a while, which I love intermittent fasting, like absolutely, you know, you could do like a an OMAD approach and just do one meal a day um, on, on that. I've done that before, um, like fasting just around it. But if you're not somebody who is, uh, is fat adapted and you're going to get that shakiness or it's going to cause you to binge, I really recommend just making sure that you're having a breakfast that has, you know, a decent amount of protein and fat in it. So like bacon and eggs, you know, that's, I mean, that's a great breakfast for you. If you know, you're going to go a little hog wild on the carbs later, because it's just going to kind of set you up with something really satiating. Um, I mean, I would love it if you threw like some broccoli in there, you know, make it like a scramble, um, other vegetables and stuff like that, just so you've got, got like a nutrient dense Mm -hmm. meal. And then that way you go into you go into your holiday meal with a with balanced blood sugar and just nourished. Um, I mean, like Thanksgiving mm-hmm. or Christmas dinner is not usually it's home cooked or a lot of the times, you know, people are cooking. So it's not like it's the worst food ever. Usually, but what ends up happening is you've got all the appetizers before and all the desserts after. And instead of just having you know, one cookie or one piece of pie, you're having a little bit of this and a little bit of that. So, you know, make sure that the meal before that is, is, you know, has some nutrients, definitely has protein and definitely has fat so that you can, Mm -hmm. you know, just, you want to be stable (laughs) and, and nourished. Um, But also, you know, if, if bacon and eggs aren't your thing, like think about, I try to tell people, think about what healthy meal that you really do love that mm-hmm. makes you feel really good in your body and and go for that and then after the meal if you're going to eat again do the same thing book and book and a really indulgent meal with two really clean like mm-hmm. very nourishing meals uh maybe lighter meals uh but if you're not going to you know a lot of people will have breakfast and then like for Thanksgiving you you have kind of a late mm-hmm. like a late lunch early dinner and um and then you probably don't eat again cuz you eat so much then or you have leftovers later and that's part of the tradition so you know that's your deal that's what you like to do don't mm-hmm. beat yourself up for it but i will say walking after um a high carb meal does really help with insulin sensitivity and blood sugar regulation so that can be a new holiday tradition and just I think it's so funny how we've normalized so many things. Like I remember one year for during Thanksgiving, my brother was saying like, well, yeah, Mm -hmm. you know, you like, it's like a Thanksgiving tradition. You have like a stomach ache after like, you're just so full that your stomach hurts. And I was like, yeah, that's such a weird thing. You know, like the unbuttoning of the pants and you go lie down on the couch and you're just like, oh, like that's, that's a terrible (laughs) tradition for us to have. We don't need to do that. (laughs) You can opt out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I say that's like unsubscribe. <laughs> when you were talking, I was like thinking we used to say, "Oh, it's the tryptophan and the turkey." Well, I eat turkey all year round, or, you know, moderately. I don't eat a ton of meat, but turkey is one of the ones that chicken doesn't always agree with me. But turkey is usually okay, and um, yeah, I, I don't get tryptophan effect any other. 
<laughs> but you have a couple glasses of wine and that's sugar. And um, yeah, you know, what I love as a comfort food is beans and rice. I've really gotten, I've gotten really attached yeah. to the beans and rice. And I was vegan for like during COVID, I couldn't eat meat. It was just, I don't know. But I, I did, I yeah. made my own vegan cheese and I, I, I got really fond of, you know, bay leaf, making homemade black beans, like mm. so yummy. I love bay leaves. Just make that with a couple scrambled eggs and, mm, you know, and that makes you feel really full for a while, the, the beans and the rice. Yeah. But just get creative, like things that you like. You can eat weird things for breakfast. Like you can have a sweet potato for breakfast. That's perfectly fine. Yeah, I mean, I I would definitely say make sure if get some kind of protein in there, whether it's a a vegan source of protein or, um, you know, and a little and a little bit of fat, because that too, you know, there is that fiber in there, and it is definitely more nutrient dense than like a bowl of cereal. But it, that will kind of spike your blood sugar if you just eat the sweet potato on its own. But I mean, like you said, if if the beans and rice with a scrambled egg like feels really good in your body, like there you go, you've got your carbs, you've got your fiber, you got some. protein protein, like fantastic, you know, throw some avocado in there maybe. Oh yeah. Oh, that sounds so good. And then do you love hemp seeds? Aren't those awesome? Like I do love hemp seeds. Yes. I'm so in love with hemp seed and then a little olive oil and and like some smoked salt and puree that up in your little food processor and you can sprinkle that on your sweet potato. That's like, Oh, that sounds delicious. I love that. That sounds really, really good. good. And you can do a little nutritional yeast Mm -hmm. in there too, if you want. It's so yummy. Just just like throw that on. But yeah, it's just be mindful. Look, look for some, look for some options, roast some, roast extra veggies at night Mm -hmm. and then you can just throw them in your scramble in the morning, it feels so good. And, you know, your kids, that won't hurt your kids either if they eat that instead of a waffle. Yeah. And that's another thing. Like, I think people, we have these ideas of what breakfast foods are um, or what kid foods are. And that's all like, we've made that up in our heads. Like, Kids, you know, you know, waffles, sure, it's an easy thing and it's easy for them to eat, but like, you know, that's not, that's not, I don't know. Like you can, you can, kids will get used to real food. I mean, I know some kids are very picky and there are nutritionists who specialize in, you know, kind of how to work with that. But I mean, there are a lot of things you can do to sneak vegetables and fruits into into ki- more kid friendly foods if you do have a really picky kid, but also just, you know, introduce things that um, experiment, make it fun because, it's, yeah, it's just, it's, I think our kids are being set up for blood sugar dysregulation because of the school lunches. I mean, they're so most of the time really, really imbalanced and very not, not real food. You know, we we're so we've really come far from like what is actual food. And it's hard because we're so busy. We've created these really impossible schedules for ourselves. And, you know, sometimes real food is is it feels expensive. Um, it's not as convenient, but you will notice a difference and the more you can connect to your food and part of connecting to your food can come from when you're actually preparing it. It's just like, I really want people to start cooking more, even if it's just one, one extra meal a week. Like, like it's, yeah, you know, eating everything out of a box. It's just not, you just can't get like really high quality nutrition that way. It's, you know, it's, it's, it, it feels inconvenient, but we've just sort of like come so far away from, <laughs> you know, I don't know what I feel like should be, should be the norm. Right. It's, it, yeah, we, yeah. we have. And, and I think it's just a matter of questioning. And so many things are in our worlds are becoming a little chaotic. And I think there's room for change when there's, when there's just disruption in production, when you can't get certain things, you're like, well, what about this? And then you might, you might make a better choice or you might, you might stop and look at how many ingredients are in that, that item and realize, I don't even know what half that is. And I think that if, if people did a deep dive on artificial flavors and what mm-hmm. exactly that means, 
they would really question artificial flavors because yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff. And I want to say that it's crap that they put in our food. And, and even mm-hmm. in Europe, a lot of this stuff has been yeah. outlawed, like BHT. They can't put that in, in food in Europe, but we allow oh, it yeah. because we have lobbyists <laughs> that push it through or it might be part mm-hmm. of some other package that, you know, just do a deep dive. Look at what's in your food. You, mm-hmm. you know, you can really eat cheap mm-hmm. if you can get to simple because the processed food can be pricey because you're not getting big portions like you can buy a pound of beans and soak them and eat them for three meals in different ways and that's like a pound of beans is like a dollar 49 you know like you can't eat any cheaper than that and a cup of rice Mm -hmm. i mean that makes like three cups when you cook Mm it and um Mm -hmm. so yeah it's just get curious get you know get stingy with how you're you know make sure if you're spending money it's something that tastes good as healthy, not just because it's convenient. Yes. yes. I hear your message. So it resonates with me so much. I just really appreciate it. And then, okay, so I want to ask you something else. Um, In keeping your sugar down, I've noticed there's a lot more mocktails coming out. So, but then the mocktails have a lot of sugar too. So if, if you're going out and you're like, I want to sleep good tonight. I don't want to have two glasses of wine. Alcohol and sugar together are like, it's really not great. It's not great for your liver. It's also, uh, alcohol consumption is actually one of the number one lifestyle related risk factors for breast cancer. And that's something that doesn't get talked about that much because unfortunately people just don't want to give up their alcohol and I get it. You know, it's, it's become such an ingrained part of our culture. Um, it's become such a self soothing mechanism for, for, you know, so many people. And, um, but it is, it is like, I think it's up to 25% of breast cancer cases are attributed to alcohol consumption. So it's, it's kind of scary. And it, I, I don't think people realize that, that, and part of it is because alcohol increases estrogen and it also causes, you know, it, it sort of ties up your liver in your detoxification pathways. So, you know, if your body is focused on detoxifying the alcohol in your system, it can't detoxify all the other endocrine disrupting chemicals and toxins that, that we have to deal with. So that's another, it's a tough thing, but yeah, I mean, you know, people, people drink, I mean, two drinks a week or less is what's the recommendation in terms of breast cancer risk reduction, um, which is not a lot for a lot of people. We, we've become a culture that is, you know, we're drinking a lot, especially women we're, we're drinking a lot. (laughs) Yes. But I'm sorry, your question if you're between a mocktail and alcohol, you'd be better off to get the sugar in the mocktail or ask them, is, could you just get fruit juice and not any syrups? Um, you know, ask them how they make that mocktail because there's hidden sugar in that. Have you had any experience with those mocktails? Um, yeah, you know, I, I think because I have adopted a pretty low sugar lifestyle for quite some time, you get the amazing thing about sugar is that when you pull it out of your diet, like you get really sensitive to it. So like I can't drink a regular cocktail without it just feeling so sweet to me. So like realize that if you do want to get off that sugar train and it will improve your life in so many different ways, um, you you can, and then you won't need as much sugar. So you can ask them to make the thing with, you know, half the simple syrup or just a splash of the juice. Mm-hmm. And it's still super refreshing and tasty. And if I do have alcohol, I go for low sugar options like a vodka soda with like a little squeeze of lemon or a mm-hmm. glass of sparkling wine. Things like that are, are a bit lower. And then, you know, you can always alternate like one beverage with like a a glass of water. That's always a good practice. Um, because yeah, for me, if I go Mm. over two drinks, it's going to disrupt my sleep. It's gonna, um, you know, then you also, you start to, your inhibitions go down. So you're just like, well, I'm just going to have a burrito or whatever, (laughs) um, you know, or get some cheese fries. Yeah. Yeah. Like let's get nachos. (laughs) Yeah. That, that becomes like a lot more, you know, easy, which, 
not the end of the world if you do it, yeah. but um, I feel a lot more in yeah. control of what like foods I'm consuming when I don't drink or when I keep it to like very minimal drinking. Um, so yeah, those are, those are a couple things, but yeah, I mean the mocktails, I, I love that we're moving towards mocktails. I think people are starting to, mm-hmm. to really kind of take a look at our alcohol consumption and see where we're at with that. But, uh, but yeah, there's definitely mm-hmm. a lot of sugar in, in many of those drinks and ask them what's in it, but know that you could probably mm-hmm. ask them to put a little bit less. Mm-hmm. And same with smoothies. When you go oh, for yeah. smoothies, they call it Turbano. The fancy name. And I'm like, no Turbano. Or mm-hmm. half, if for my kids, I'm like half mm-hmm. Turbano, you know. And and I I like it just as much without any added sugar. But yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. just ask. How do you feel about, oh, go ahead. Yeah, sometimes at those smoothie places, if they're putting like two bananas in your smoothie, like you're already getting a good good jolt of sugar um, from that that smoothie. So, you know, that's, again, it's like, I always encourage people try to see, try to put some protein in there, maybe a little bit of fat just to, cause you know, like Jamba juice, a Jamba juice that can be just like a, a, a sugar crash <laughs> waiting to occur. You know, <laughs> what do you think about like kombucha? Are you a fan of kombucha? Yeah, I am a fan of kombucha. There are, you know, those can, I don't, do super great with those for some reason. I don't know why. Um, but they are, you know, kombucha, if if you like kombucha, that's definitely, you know, it's adding some good bacteria to the gut. We all know like gut health is a big topic right now in the health world. And it can really affect so many aspects of your life, your cravings, your emotions. There's this this whole mind-body connection um, with gut health. And, uh, yeah, I think kombucha is, kombucha is great, but that's another thing where it's like, you know, you read the, read the labels. Some of them are a little bit high sugar, but if you're going to have to choose between like a soda and some kombucha, go for the kombucha for sure. Yeah. I love any probiotic stuff. Yeah. I tried to make my own kombucha, but the Scooby was a little scary. <laughs> I was like, I can't deal with the Scooby. Have you? <laughs> oh, I've, I've done that. Too. Yes. 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 I, yes. They, it, it is. It's like this weird alien yeah. thing. And yeah, I had it and I had it in like the closet because you have to kind of have it outside of the light. And I was just like, this is kind of, it is, it's kind of creepy. It's kind of creepy. And then I felt bad when it dried up and died. I was like, I killed it. It's like the it's like the goldfish floating at the top of the tank. I'm like, I killed it. Oh, I felt so bad. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's fascinating, but it is. I I I have I have to agree. I, I made my own sauerkraut once, and yeah, but the 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 kombucha with the scoby is definitely yeah. It's like ooh, 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 weird. <laughs> yeah, but some people really some people really love it. I mean, it's even like sourdough starter that became a big thing during the lockdown. Like that's also a living organism. I love that. I love that. And I did see like there's a hundred year old sourdough that they these families have kept this yeast alive for over a hundred years. That's just wild. It's so cool. Oh, well, I just we're we're coming to the end of our time, and I feel like there's we got to so much, but we you know like there are other things we wanted to cover. But um, I just really I really appreciate this this dialogue. We had so much fun exploring sugar and and I just love that I agree when I when I did that sugar detox and then I had something oh I think I bit into a Snickers bar and I thought my head was going to explode like I felt so bad I was like how do people eat a Snickers bar like how and you just don't even I can't even eat like regular candy anymore it has to be like dark chocolate because you know my body's like no once you do that detox Mm -hmm. Yeah. It adjusts. 
Yeah. And that's the great thing. So for people who are like, what? I could never do that. Like, just know your body adjusts and then you really start craving. Your, your body really wants you to thrive. You know, it doesn't want you to suffer. And once you start giving it what it really needs to, to thrive, it will, it will adjust and you'll, your cravings change. So don't be afraid to try new things. Uh, and even just taking like a week or two off of sugar, um, you know, a little bit longer is probably the longer, the better. But when you go back to it, I mean, you can eat like, you can eat like a grape and you're like, oh my goodness, that is, it feels, it feels so sweet. And so, um, you know, almost like candy. If, if you haven't had that, it's like the best candy. That's what I, yeah, that's what I was just going to say. You took the words right out of my mouth. It's like the, nature's candy. You're just like, whoa, raisins. Whoa. (laughs) I found when I eat well, I I have more energy and I don't mind the extra steps it takes because I feel so good. It doesn't bother me that, you know, I'm I'm doing a little more work around my food. Exactly. Yes. That's exactly, yes. What such a important message. Like, you know, as people feel overwhelmed with the idea of cooking more. You don't have to cook every meal for every all the time and when you just start out, but you will start wanting to more and more because you will feel better and you'll want to chase that that feeling. And you know, we're human beings. We we want to feel good. We don't like being uncomfortable. And when you know notice that when you feel that difference in your body, it, it is, uh, it's addictive. And I think that's why so many people who do go into the field of nutrition and wellness, they've had some kind of experience like that firsthand. And maybe they had to ha- go under a specific health protocol or something. They were forced into it, uh, or they were experimenting mm-hmm. with something for some reason. And then you, when you experience it for yourself and the power that food has on your emotions, on your energy levels, on the way that your body feels, moves, and looks, you you really put that connection together and it just, it makes you want to do it more. And, uh, and it's not, and it's not hard <laughs> once you, you realize like, oh, this is the cause and the effect. And you're worth it. You're worth it to spend the time and, and look into maybe there's some meal plans. Do you, um, oh, you made me think of your awesome website with you have, you have a love playlist on your website and it helps you move and groove and, and feel good and it's energetic. So I wanted you to share your website, how people can reach you and you'll do, you do consultations on there, right? If people want to talk about, you know, what's going on with them and you just, bounce some stuff off of you. You're there. So Sure. So my website is juniebewell.com. And yeah, there's a form on there under the contact tab. If you are interested in in working together and you want to see how you might benefit from nutritional therapy, then yeah, I offer a free consult call. Uh, it's usually about a 20 minute call and we just kind of talk about what's going on with you. And I let you know, yeah, this is what, this is what we could probably do. And, um, because everything is really individual and, um, and there's that, and there's there are some freebies on my page. Some are breast cancer specific, but the general one, which I uh, brought up for your particular show, is called the Self Love Dance Party Playlist, and it uses a technique called habit stacking. So you know we do better when we're kind of killing two birds with one stone. So it's a playlist that you can use to you know as a soundtrack to clean your house for a party for a run, for a walk, um, whatever you want, just to pump you up and feel better. And it really, it's, it's one of those playlists that has songs that you can't not move, can't not move. You can't not be like, yeah, just kind of get, you know, those songs. Um, so these are all my favorite songs for just feeling good, upping your, your, your mood and your energy and, and kind of making it so it's impossible for you not to move. Uh, and that's a free download on my website. Um, on social media, Instagram is my big one. Um, I'm at Junie Be Well there, but I'm also on Facebook and LinkedIn and people can find me there. And I also have a podcast. It's called Tata Cancer on all the major podcast players. And that's mainly focused on um, breast cancer stuff, but healing from, from breast cancer. Oh, Jeannie, this has just been a delight. I really had fun talking to you and learning. I learned so much. 
I, I just adored this. So thank Yay. you so much. Thank you. It was great Yay. to talk to you too. Thanks for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the episode. As always, you can go to my website and make any comments, suggestions, just share anything that's on your heart about any of the episodes. If you visit www.youneedapeptalk.com, you can find every episode and feel free to share. Your subscription to my podcast really matters. So if you can subscribe, share, like, go to Apple and rate my podcast, that really helps my listenership and gets my message out to as many people as possible. So I do appreciate that. And as always, enjoy each day as each moment is a chance to create the life of your dreams. Take care.